Yeah, we on Boss Talk 101. Yeah, we gonna talk, we gonna have fun. We be on fire, we be lit lit. It's a unique hustle. Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique host. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely official Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Nothing, nothing, my day. Walk on. Hey, man. Hey, man. We over here in Los Angeles, man, with the best. You know what I mean? I love when we rock with the best, man. Yes, it's going down, man. Hey, man. Stop playing, man. Mr. Farmer Melvin Farmer is here with us today. Hey, I can't believe it. Uh, thank you for having me, man. And it's an honor and privilege, and God allowed us to there come together to make this happen, man. So it's a privilege. And man. Honor. Thank you. Man, thank you, man. Thank you for coming in, man. That's what I'm talking about, man. So, um, you know, uh, when we when we think about uh, you, um, I went and I started looking, researching, and I looked on Vlad first, didn't I? Because mm -hmm. that's what y'all told me. Look on Vlad. You'll see him on there. He on there. And I looked, and it said that you were the original, like one of the main guys that started the Crips, wasn't it? Well, uh, I've been around since the West Side Crips started with Tookie, uh, uh, Monkey Man, uh, uh, Jamel. It's just when it was the West Side. That's and, when it started? Well, on the West Side. Okay. Uh, Raymond Marshall in uh, 69, 70 on the east side of town. That's the other side of the 110 freeway. Uh, they were called Cribs with two Bs back then. Uh -huh. Then Tookie and Raymond Washington merged and James Compton and others, and they formed the East Side Crips, the West Side Crips, and it started crystallizing uh, from there uh, till they broke into what they have today known as sets. Okay. Uh, a Trey Gangster now at 19, at 15 and a half, uh, I was a co founder of the A Trey Gangster Crips uh, at 15 and a half, wow. which is the A Trey's today. So that's. Uh, uh, I've been in the game since I was 14. That's, I'm 64 now, so wow. I've been mm. out here in 35 years in prison, uh, numerous arrests. Uh, uh, 35 years in prison? Yeah. Half of your life? Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the pattern and the staple of what we was doing in. So uh, as an eyewitness to this and a, a survival, uh, of this violent world, because it's very violent. You see the sugar coatedness, uh, where you can image and act and talk over the internet, and it'll be over in a couple of hours. That ain't how this go. This ain't over with in a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. It don't end cut. And uh, we just try to bring awareness to senseless gun violence, uh, other uh, things that are affecting our community and try to build up our community. Wow. I love that. I love that because I've always um, asked for unity. I've always, every time when people come on our show, whether it be rappers or just people who are trying to make a change, and I always say, how are you planning to do this? Because you have some of these young kids out here who feel like they're on top of the world. And no matter who you are or what you've been through or what you've done, they're not listening. It's like, who are you to tell me? Your time, you owe, your time is done. Now it's my time. I do what I want to do. So like, how can you get through to people like that? Well, first of all, uh, when you're on the streets, uh, your age does it, because a lot of them don't live to get old in this game. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And it's a different uh, standards. Uh, if you hold yourself up as a man, uh, you know, you start a day don't know nothing about the struggle, civil rights. Uh, they don't look up to Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, they never That's heard true. of them. That's but true. I got guys, uh, men, women, and children, they call me from all over the world uh, asking me uh, about their uh, life and their decisions in life and what they should do where they want to hear a change. So a lot of times these youths are being listening to older ones that mm -hmm. live that life because they know that they come and they stand in for the truth. But what happens is we don't have the resources to give them and help them uplift themselves. So if they look at it and see somebody like me or I told them are, and we out here in this struggle because we strictly grassroots, we don't get a dime. Mm -hmm. They're going to say, well, what can you do for me? And they're not paying me. Right. But you give us the resources where we can be ambassadors because I don't believe nobody in the United States carry more weight when it comes to knowing the players in this game from all factions, audio, video, print. There's nobody that we can't reach out and touch and talk to and create dialogue that otherwise wouldn't even occur. 
Right. Because we've said that, because even in Dallas, you said that where um, when you have people who still go out here to try to make changes, you have to also be careful because some people go out here to try to make changes, but just to look good on social media. They go in different cities and say, okay, I want change. I want violence to stop, but they have all these cameras up and, you know, just to make it seem like they're doing something good, but they're not really investing the time and being there when the cameras are not on. Yeah, their boots not around to the ground when the camera's not around. Right. And that's the difference. A lot of times uh, people are doing the real the work, the mm -hmm. boots, the grunt work, but they don't have the platform to express and give out the information or the things that they're doing to get the community. I've won numerous awards, uh, was involved in Nipsey Hustle, uh, LA Gangs Unite, Biggie Small, a whole lot of uh, civil rights, Margaret Laverne Mitchell, Amadou Diallo, the Death Row 10, uh, the Howard University uh, student killed, Prince Jones. I can name a litany of things. I'm an author, but I try to not talk about me. I don't like talking to me. Mm -hmm. I like doing and telling my experience where it's not braggadocious. It is what it is. Uh, and give back to the community because of the things that I've done. So do you believe that if some, excuse me, yes, okay. like, if you believe, do you believe that if there was someone back then who was doing what you're trying to do now and they did that for you, do you think your outcome would have been different than it, it is now? Well, they did, but it created a gap. You had the Black Panthers, I've witnessed them, us organizations, the Muslims, they were pro-black. They were standing up for civil rights and they era the 60s, the 50s. It's a different era, like 50 years now. My era, the 70s, the 80s. But the thing of it is, we got our ear to the pavement where we right there with everybody, where we can relate to what's going on because we're feeling I get shot at just like everybody else. I'm still going to jail. I'm on 83 years parole. I'm still being unfairly treated in the justice system. So I'm a gamut of all of them. So all of it is uh, painted to me with a brush. And we just have to let, like we did if we take away Instagram and all that, and let us start telling the stories of how we come up and the things that our parents did and struggle, because the number one deterrent for crime is age. Mm. As you get older, mm -hmm. you mellow out. Exactly. I wanted to just ask, well, just kind of, I guess, add on or ask about the <clears throat> what you said earlier about, I don't know, you, do, you, you, like, you really don't get on, you know, getting on social media is one thing, but without your story, you know, I think the younger generation don't get to see what really caused the thing that, cause a lot of times your history is what helps you to understand where you're going. And you are our history when it comes to what happened in LA, right? So in order for us to see that, then you have to be on platforms like this, the Vlads, all the stuff where these young kids are going. Cause what it does is it in, injects something, some purity in it to show that people do change and that there is a sense of direction in what, <coughs> Uh, transpired in our history. Yes, sir. And uh, make it uh, uh, short into a nutshell, falsehood cannot coexist permanently with the truth. On social media, a lot of times people tell stories or tales and there's nobody there to validate them or challenge them to where they tell a tale. That's all it is, it's a tale. And therefore they're being influenced by guys that aren't real representations of the communities or the gangs that they're representing. And people get confused uh, when that, and we believe that those that are closest to the problem are more likely than not closer to the solution. Okay. Question. And, and now you, most of the influence are on there. A lot of them are, are that people really look up to is these rappers. A lot of the music and the stuff that's flowing through those avenues is what's influencing our children. Mm -hmm. So um, we have to have platforms to where some real essence of what really going down. That's why I love podcasting, because it cuts through and say, this is this is it, too. 
This is something that 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 can 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 you know the music is one thing because these kids are listening to that, but then then they jump on listening at our channel and they see in all these different rappers and then boom, we hit them with a person like Mr. Melvin Farmer and then they able to they gonna watch it because we know over time that that's a habit forming thing, correct? Yeah, but also every generation has had music R and B the sixties the forties the doo wop. So we just can't look in hindsight. Mm -hmm. Their music is no more different than we was talking earlier about NWA. It's every 10 years you're going to get a different genre of music. And it comes down to drugs, mental health, uh, homelessness, uh, uh, being tough. These are the images that have been cultivated over the years through the generations of music. So we have to let them know that it's a better way, that we can make it a different way, and also hold people accountable for the things that they say on social media. That's so you true. have to have an oversight, and it have to be some firm rules to where they all apply. I agree 100%. So um, when in your life did you make this change from the person that you were to the person you are now? Well... And, uh, and what happened? Like, what brought that awareness to you? Well, a couple of incidents. Uh, I never read the Bible, first of all. And mm -hmm. the jail is the easiest place you can uh, get a Bible. They're going to give you that. They exactly. They out as a care package. But uh, in 1994, uh, March 7th, they came out with the California Three Strikes Law, automatic life sentence. And I was targeted to... Uh, be framed, which I wrote a book and I brought it, the new slave ship, a ship that does not sail. And uh, I was arrested with less than uh, two, one point gram or less or whatever. But at the end of the day, I got 25 to life and a 10 year mm. consecutive sentence, although the dope was planted on me. So uh, I was the first one to be released after serving three years and eight months. Uh, I got a reversal first in the state of California, historically. And uh, everybody there, we on a level four yard, and everybody there uh, are lifers, not going home. We in a, a stand-up casket where we walking into the graveyard. And all of them to a man uh, said, uh, homie, when you leave, don't forget about us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't forget that, but I also kept faith because man had tried to take my life but I also had enough sense to know that God had gave me a new life. Right. Well, so I got out, I wrote a book. Uh, I've been doing civil rights 25 years now. I mentor youths, uh, uh, prison ministry coordinator, and uh, I still uh, get into things because I never worked a day in my life till maybe two years ago. I've always been a hustler from ice cream trucks to armor trucks getting my and uh, one more important thing after I escaped getting the death penalty in Georgia that I'm on 83 years, this time for once in my life, my mother said, uh, don't go to jail. And I've been arrested 50, 60 and times. And that was the first time she said that. She's ever said. When I tell my mom I got a problem, she tells me, be careful. She don't say don't do nothing, and that's from A to Z. But this time, she said, I'm getting old. Uh, you got two younger sisters. Uh, I can't afford you to go back to jail. And I quit cold turkey. I've been out wow. seven years now. So wow. I'm trying to make my mama proud. See? Wow. That's so touching to me because it's like, and I love the fact that she didn't say it before because if she said it before and kept saying it, you would have took it to heart as much. Well, let me tell you this about my mama. She witnessed the Crips, and she knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. My mama read on the wall when I was 15 and a half where somebody on the road, Melvin Farmer, must die. That's when she went and got insurance on me. Mm. She still got that insurance, and the policy haven't been kept to this day. So my mother, her car don't been shot up. Most guys I did, and most of them have got three things in common, a conviction in murder, 30-some years in prison, over 50, 60 arrests. I don't show my friends because I get inboxes where they, hey, 
that man killed my husband. Hey, he killed my son. She did this. They did that. So I don't put them up. This is a whole different ball game. This is the things that you don't hear about. If a big old G get hit, they ain't coming to look for them. They coming to look for me. Mm. See how this game go? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to know how to avoid these traps and stay in your lane. I don't look at social media. I don't look at nobody podcast. So whenever I hear whatever going on in social media, WAC 1069, Charleston White in this, Mob James in that, I can go and just call. Or they call me and tell me about it. And then now, but then nobody called me for money. <laughs> <laughs> but they'll call me when it's a problem. When wow. A problem. See, and that's guilt by association. Right. And that's what happens a lot to me. And I know, I don't know if you did, you just mentioned you, you, Mob James in Charleston was just in um, Dallas on on his podcast, and I know you got a phone call. Um, it was because of two different agreements. I mean, two different ways that two different people done things. So <clears throat> when I look at it, I know that both of them had good intentions, without a shadow of a doubt. But both live two different lifestyles in two different parts of the world. And so when I look at it, I hear all the things and I do, I am on social media, so I do see the comments, you know what I mean? So how do, how do you bridge those gaps when two people are trying to do the right thing and you know both of them? Well, let me put it like this once again. I don't look at social media, so when you say what they said, I don't know. I don't know. What was said? I only can go by what you heard. No, 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 not what I heard. It's how somebody treats you. And therefore, that makes me an unbiased urban analyst. I got it. Because if I don't know nothing, I can't speak on it. If, if nobody brought up none of them, I wouldn't know nothing. Mm. I don't surf so I don't even look at my show, whatever I do. I don't go and look twice. Never have. I don't look at nothing twice. <laughs> have never looked at no... Uh, menace to society, have not read Tookie books, have not read Cody's book. I stay in my lane because usually what they're talking about, I've lived. But I know the rules to this game. So if I don't know nothing, unless somebody tell me, I might get a call from Ray Sean. That's Raymond Washington's daughter, which I did. Pretty boy got a call. I told him more. Got a call. Mob James got a call. Stag got a call. Mob B got a call. I can name them on and on about stuff on social media where now it's a problem. So if I don't know nothing, that's guilt by association with me. Everybody assume that I look and want to, I ain't got time for that. Every day I'm trying to get a hustle and get something to do to make my mama proud, mm -hmm. to stay safe, and I just stay out the way. So I want that to be known. So when you ask me about them, I really can't speak on it because I ain't looked to listen to it. I'm Makes only sense. going by exactly what whoever told me. And that's it. Wow. I know you say you, um, you're working to make your mama proud. And I, I know a lot of people, a lot of men are usually mama's boys. So um, that's what you're doing now. But back then when your mom's car was being shut up, and the reason why I'm asking a lot of these type of questions is because you have young kids out here who are not thinking about mom, who's not thinking about a sister, who's not thinking about the dangers of the life. Um, back then you weren't thinking about that. Why, why not? Oh, I was thinking about that, but it's a big difference. My parents didn't know what we were doing. They didn't catch on. They didn't so even know. when that was by the up. end, by the end, it was too late. They didn't know nothing about us sneaking out the back window. It was a revolving door. We was 14, 15, 16, 17. It, it was better uh, going to jail where you got your own bed. Sometimes it crowded, but everything I always did. See, I wasn't a, just a gangbanger. 
I've always, uh, we didn't have the things to do. Uh, identity theft, sell dope, uh, credit cards, oh, a whole fluctuation of things that you can do to hustle. You mm-hmm. had to basically go and take it mm-hmm. and get it. So everything I did, I did in the sense that I'm taking this to give my mama a better life. See, a lot of people, I don't rob jewelry stores, gave everybody fur uh, rings and watches, fur coats, all this. But I didn't think of it as hurting my mama because I'm only thinking it's hurting me mm-hmm. at that age. So you're right. At that aspect, 14, 15, 16 year old, I knew I was a basketball player. Ranked number one, but it was the choices I made at that time. So in hindsight, uh, I feel that the time that I did going to jail, it should have been more worth it to be with my mom. Mm-hmm. To see the look in her eyes, uh, the hurt as her only son, and a lot of men. Mark, mom, passed, and every day uh, he's talking and he's reminded of her, and he keep her legacy going on. So... It's a something that, you know, is hurtful, and we just try to make our parents proud, uh, mm-hmm. at least I do. I know, because that's, that's what I always ask, because even, like, in Texas, you heard about the shooting with um, Mo3 when Mo3 got, did you hear that one? Yeah, somebody came and okay, talked about it. I just want to make sure you heard that. Mm-hmm. No, because um, a lot of times when things happen, we're beef, even with um, celebrities or just anybody have beef, I always wonder you keep pushing this beef keep pushing this beef with this other person but you're not thinking about you have a wife or a baby mom or a mother that if they don't come get you they're going to come get them and you're putting them in danger too so here you having an argument whether for clout because that's what a lot of people are doing nowadays just for the ratings the views the all of that why don't you think about them because after you're dead and gone, you're leaving them in a situation because I guarantee you, not like your mom, your mom put insurance on you. Not everybody think ahead like that, put insurance on a person when they're doing something like that. You know what I mean? To make sure that I'm safe, I'm secure, I, I can take care of these kids. Why don't they think about that? Well, uh, the streets, the only thing stronger than a man's pride is a mother's love. A man a swallow every type of pill it is to stay alive, but they won't swallow their pride. Well, so many men have lost their pride or lost their life uh, to where all they had to do was step back. Mm -hmm. But they chose to go through uh, conflict resolution at its most extreme, which usually ends up in a death. And I, I hate that because in my, the older I get, and this is what I always say on this platform, because you, you don't ever know who is listening. It's always how you perceive something, because a lot of these arguments is always caused by you say something, and you may not even mean it in a bad way, but I perceive it in a bad way, so I'm reacting. And it caused, and you don't like the way how I reacted. You're not saying to me, well, how did you mean it? By, you know, and resolve it in a decent way. That's how miscommunication happens every day, even in relationships or friendships or whatever, where, and we've had somebody on our show who, he, he, he was good friends with um, another gentleman, and the one got shot, and because the other one never reached out to him, but he didn't even know that he had gotten shot. So he was mad at him because he didn't reach out to him, but he didn't even know that he had gotten shot, and he wasn't talking to him just because of that. Mm-hmm. Until one day, eventually, he reached out and he's like, but I didn't know. You mm-hmm. know, but something simple like that, and you're mad at somebody, pick up the phone and call. Just because somebody don't call you, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, did you hear about X, Y, Z, or, you know? And that's how it should be on the internet. A lot of guys air their personal disputes on the internet. When if you're really about that business, you can call them up, inbox them, and keep that going on. But I understand Mm -hmm. social media and the things that that do because, you know, uh, Michael Conception told me this once. And let me say something about Mike. He's the most powerful in hip hop. Okay. I promise you. I've been around him since he started in that. One of the top, you have them those that are faces 
mm-hmm. uh, uh, certain mm-hmm. uh, rappers and things now because of technology, but nobody has survived more than Michael Conception, starting with uh, uh, We All in the Same Game, Teddy Riley, mm-hmm. uh, 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 Russell Simmons, uh, 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 just a, a, a whole gang of them. <laughs> And I can name him, but you right. know, he, he, he should be getting his props in a lot of times. His name is not mentioned. So uh, back to the, uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's a man's pride. And uh, when you're young, you don't be thinking about who you hurting, you really don't. You're more allegiance to the group that you with, because a lot of times they're showing more love to you as a group as opposed to where a lot of time men or women, they're shy from the love of a parent of, ah, that's corny. And they think this is what's really happening. And when reality is the flip strip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So going back to when you was in prison, in and out 35 years of your life, there had to be some people that you were, you influenced as you, your change came about far as the guys that are still, some of them, especially what you do in prison ministry as well, because I know they've seen you come back into the prison. No, nah, I'm not eligible to go uh, into prison. So, so I, how, how did you affect the prison ministry? Well, I got, my friend has a church and I do prison ministry uh, there and other places around uh, when I speak uh, biblically or about uh, a witness, because you have to have, you just can't go and, and preach to somebody on the streets. Mm-hmm. Cause they don't appreciate the Lord, so that message ain't gonna get to them. Especially when you're talking about an inner city youth, to where most churches want you to come in on your feet, but they won't let you in on your back. Mm-hmm. In other words, when these kids uh, don't have insurance or nothing, and they need a place to be buried in Los Angeles, they want to charge them an arm and a leg, the big five, seventeen thousand. Wow. But let Magic Johnson or a celebrity get killed, somebody with money to pay for it, they do it for free. free. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, these are the type of things that we try to address and uh, bring awareness to. And these youths, you just can't think that they're going to turn their guns in for no concert ticket. Or why would they turn their guns in uh, when everybody else is armed? See, we got the only race to wear uh we, we attack our own where every other race, they'll kill us because of the color of our skin. We only get at each other because of the areas we stay in. Well, I, when I, as, as, I, as when you speak, <clears throat> what, I, what I really think about is the influence and the impact and the people that I feel like in the, on the West Coast, they influenced a lot of people. A lot of a lot of young people, the 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 the, the kids, the, the kids pretty much wear red and blue because of what they seen up here. This this didn't just happen here and it hit a few towns. This hit the whole some other countries. I'm pretty sure it's on uh, Bloods and Crips, red and blue, are on all seven continents. Yeah, you're gonna have either or, and uh, you don't have the same dynamics. The, the uh, streets, California sets the example for the United States. It changed the game. But uh, uh, back to, uh, I didn't answer that about, about the influence that's right. uh, in uh, jail as opposed to the streets. Well, uh, my influence as far as uh, influencing those in prison, it wasn't no influence, but I did bring awareness to the three strikes law, uh, brought to, uh, awareness to them being uh incarcerated behind the wall and uh, addressing uh, uh, restorative justice and trying to bring these young men home. So by that, you need the prison system. So if they start getting too far out of line and it jeopardizes these men's in prison freedom, they're able to check them real close and give them a hug. So you need the prisons and something that will make them stand up uh, to punish that now as far as on the streets. Uh, I influence or bring awareness to the life that you're joining up for and signed up for 
And usually at the end of the day, you're going to either get killed off in the criminal justice system or you're going to end up in the grave. Very few people are very successful uh, uh, in this game out here running these streets, uh, you know, because you pay uh, your taxes by either getting killed, going to jail, because usually your money you're getting, you're not paying taxes on it, you're hustling for it. So when you go to jail, we call that paying taxes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of youths uh, like to hear their history, their stories. They might be a blood and call me, hey man, we like to hear the history uh, of how we started this and, and this and that. And I always tell them, uh, uh, I can't influence what you do in your town, community, state, or whatever. You just make your own personal decision because for over 50, 60 years, it's very embedded here in California. This is a culture that is, it's, it's, it's nothing like it. I have to ask you this question. I go back to Charleston because he said something that was dear to me. He said that the gang members would shoot up the kids, shoot up the houses and, and, and then the kid, a, a woman or a child would may get hit, and then that the gangs would pretty much hide the guy that did this and basically pretty much uh, try to keep him from having to deal with uh, being, uh, uh, pr you know, pretty much protect him from being, being <clears throat> arrested or whatever else he would have to go through because of it. Is this something that was a practice, or is that just talk? Now, I'm just... That's allegedly. Now, uh, what I can say on that is, once again, you got 60, 50 years of this. So people, uh, like for instance, you hear about people tell stories about Crips killing Crips. Yeah. But when I tell a story, you won't hear that. So I'm predating that. So what is acceptable now? <laughs> they brag about their era. That's their era. But that's not a reflection of how this started. Oh, it started. Mm -hmm. So they need to hear this about how it was to where regardless of what it was, it was honorable. And it stayed within those. It wasn't no drive-bys, uh, shooting up with no Uzis. We damn near using bow and arrows, zip guns, uh, walk-ups. And it wasn't no uh, innocent people uh, uh, really getting hurt to where we knew what we were signing up for, whereas now it's more blatant to where, once again, I say uh, they kill uh, within the areas that you stay in. Because if you have, all you have to do is Google uh, the 100 days, the 100 nights. Uh, that was in 2015, arguably the most uh, uh, human disregard of life I ever seen when it came to killing. Uh, I survived that, or quite a lot of us did. And uh, it ain't, I don't know where somebody would know that somebody did that and hide them out and like, oh man, you killed a kid. What they gonna do is stay in their lane and mind their business. That's just how it is out here. They see, it in, in these streets, the rules are, as of now, there are no rules. But even starting out when um, the organization started, you would think, and I know that it's spread in all of these different continents, but you would think that, um, like, if I started a group and you wanted to start one over here, you had to get, like, a pass, a pass, like, permission, like, this is the rules. And I would also make, send someone over there to make sure that they're abiding by the rules of this organization. And not that anybody can just start over here and do their own thing and just wreck the brand because this is the name of the Bloods or Crips. Isn't that how it should be or isn't that how it was? Well, I'm only can speak for the Crips mm -hmm. uh, and, and the group and my, and right. my personal experience. Right. Once again, you got evolution. You got every 10 years. So you got grandfathers, uh, grandmothers nieces, nephews, grandkids. So you got a long list to where that's just fashionable now. But that's not how it was started. It wasn't a lot of people. It was no internet. It wasn't a group. It wasn't nothing fashionable about it. And it wasn't nothing to be talked about. It was understood what needed to be done, what we were doing, and what we was about. 
Simple as that. Right, in your area, but once it starts spreading everywhere else, you couldn't really control it. Well, the difference between a street gang and a prison gang is there's no structure. See, Crips, there is no one body, no one person. Mm -hmm. So there's never been a structure when it comes to Crips other than when we were east side, west side, and Compton. Okay. So then it splintered. And now you got them all over the continent, the United States. So there's not no one supreme ruler. Whereas you might have the Latin kings, you might have King Tom. You might have a, a, a John Stevenson, Black Philly mob. So those, uh, 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 Jeff Fort, Larry Hoover, they have structure. No more different than the army, law enforcement, but when it comes to a street gang, mm -hmm. There is no structure, no chain of command. Right. So that could not apply in these rules of war. Let, let me ask you this, uh, just flipping back into my childhood, uh, coming up in the streets, you know what I mean? We wore blue. Don't know why. We just wore it. We was in Texas. and uh, But my school color was blue, so we, we wore blue. It was not, I did not know. I, and my cousin was from Crenshaw. So we wore blue, you know, but didn't really understand it. But then we look up and right down the street from us in Shreveport in the 90s, they just start flying out of California, coming to Shreveport. And then we see this and we see them. And now we riding with them. Certain ones that wear blue, the ones that wear red, we, we're not rocking with them, even though there are some of them that's flying in, too. So they came in from California to Shreveport, which was 30 miles away from where I was raised up. Now, I was in the drug game at that time. And I only rock with the guys who were messing with blue. And this is how this is how it happened. But we start seeing a lot of killings and a lot of different things on the news in Arklatex during that time. And it was it got pretty rough. And I think I think Cooper Road right now is, is one of the places where still stand true to the blue. This happened. And I don't know what made them start coming down there in the 90s. Do you remember that era? Or were you around during that time? Mm -hmm. I was in Monroe, and uh, West Monroe. Oh, you was in Monroe? I was on the <laughs> run for a murder that had happened at a school campus in 76. And uh, my mama sent me to West Monroe, so I know about so Shreveport, you know about West Monroe, uh, uh, when they had a jukebox where you had to kick it to start it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my girl at that time was the only girl in the club, and everybody wanted to dance with us. I never will forget it. I got out of there in two weeks. Wow. <laughs> yes, sir. But anyway, uh, uh, from my personal experience, and I knew some people that were going down there, uh, with the transformation of the drug game coming out and an influx of cocaine, uh, and the price was so high, because uh, uh, I had a friend named Michael Jordan that married Tootie Reese, the equivalent of Mickey Barnes or somebody, yeah. when cocaine was 55000 a key at that time. He married Rhonda Reese. And so I got to witness 78, 79, Ether Basin, and uh, they start uh, shipping out along with the gang members uh, and it started catching on. That was one of the reasons as far as Crips expansion, particularly in Colorado, because in the inner cities of Los Angeles, uh, Colorado University was getting a lot of youths, uh, letting them uh, uh, come out there on a scholarship and they started transporting back then to Ron Sherry, now, they also, a little bit earlier in the 60s, uh, Marv can speak to that one day when you interview him. Mm -hmm. It was hair run, but as far as the cocaine and the gang activity, it went hand in hand when they started fluctuating from out here because as of the day, everybody wants a plug in California. Yeah. Same thing as this, California, Florida, Savannah, uh, Houston. Everybody always want a plug from Cali, and that's always existed. And so now, as far as I'm concerned, it just uh, had expanded and uh, that changed the uh, landscape of a lot of uh, cities. Okay. Yeah, um, I definitely, um, I definitely, when I look at us coming up at being young and, and, and we did not have a clue of why we was doing what we was doing. We was, 
I mean, a lot of people say, yeah, we did. I mean, but it, but it still brought prison and everything else. People going to change and flock up with different groups, no matter what, I believe, you know, even. So before Cripping, before you even had associated with Crip, were there section groups of people that hung out and hung together and pretty much that's what they done? Well, really, before that, uh, it's on the West Side, you had cliques, groups of men uh, that ran together, Tookie, uh, uh, Warlock, uh, Steve Goods, uh, uh, Buddha that got killed, Justin Baycott, uh, Eric Williams, uh, Ricardo Sims, Bud, uh, Bud, rest in peace, uh, Melvin Hardy, Monk, uh, 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 Joe Ransom. You had a lot of guys to where on the West Side, we were into integration, 69, 70, uh, you could see Tookie standing at one end of St. Andrews Park and the white folks bowling on the bowling green at the other end. So we didn't have no history of uh, like the Slawsons, the businessmen, the farmers or guys or gangs on the west side. There wasn't a lot of older guys. At the oldest might be 20. Other than that, there wasn't a lot of blacks over there because of the uh, integration that was going on. So. The West Side is uh, unique in that. So as they started the juveniles and they started mixing up uh, Henry Clay, Horace Mann, the Smacks, uh, 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 the Cafe Boys, uh, those at John Me and the Junior Heights, it started to expand and crystallize on the West Side. Then they went and ended up being formed as the West Side Crips. Cukes, Mouse, Rusty, Chucky, Todd, uh, 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 Odie Shaw, Odie Gill, Crest, uh, uh, Elmer Jones, Spy, uh, uh, Trey Ball, Melvin Hardy, James Miller. I could just name a lot yeah. of them that just uh, was in here early in the game and only uh, lost their life where they resting in peace or they resting in pain. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's hard, man. You know, because of all of the stuff that transpired throughout all those years, though, and a lot of young people grew up in that. And even when I would come out here, I wouldn't even I wear black and white or something just to stay, you know what I mean, out the way. I knew that much. You know, I'm going to stay out the way. <laughs> I'm, when I go out there, I'm going to put my black and white on and stay out the way. But when I go home, I'm cripping because that's my neighborhood. I'm being, <laughs> that's the way it was. I didn't come out here to meet nobody to hang out with them. You know what I'm saying? That wasn't my agenda. I mean, but my cousins was doing it hard. They on Crenshaw. They were cripping, you know, 40s and 60s. I did not know what that was. I just knew Crip till they came and brought it to my attention. You know, <laughs> I was like, what is that? They like, did five dudes? I'm like, oh, really? But you my cousin, so I'm going to ride with you. We already, we, we riding in the country. We just didn't know. You know what I mean? And then I'll say this, rappers. Rappers made it made it fun to wear colors. You know what I mean? They they made they still to this day have a little uh, in you uh, hidden in you and about wearing different colors and saying they were different cliques just for 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 clout. And that's real. But um, uh, but when I hear you say all those names, I didn't hear a rapper name. Mm -mm. You see, what I'm, <laughs> I'm just being real. You know. Well, what I mean? once again, I told you I don't uh, look at social media. Uh, uh, this is my crew of people who I grew up with that played they dudes, which basically paved the way for a lot of them or give them the subject and the contents that they even talk about. Mm -hmm. And that's what and, and that's what I hear. That's what I hear. No, there ain't no end. <laughs> if you sitting up on top of a hill, you think you know what's going on down here where the rats eat nobody. Mm -hmm. No, somebody telling you. Mm -hmm. Correct. And then you have the capabilities of putting it in a story. Wow. So once again, falsehoods and truth cannot coexist. Agree. Not, yeah. The simple as that. Yeah, that that was a that was the one thing and it still stands true today that there's rappers and I know that because I interview them and that's the thing. They want they this is not something that they they was jumped in. I don't think they was jumped in. Ain't nobody been jumped in uh, and even during your time, I don't know if they were jumped in. It might be just a movie. I don't know. Well, I'm going to put it like this. A tell of the tape is this. If you got more graduation pictures than mug shots, you need to not even be talking, man. <laughs> I'm serious, man. How are you going to have more graduation pictures than mug shots? But wow. you that guy. Wow. Yeah, it's wow. a big difference. Man. And once again, 
it is nothing to glamorize. Mm-hmm. A lot of parents have been hurt. Yeah. And it's always two sides. On a police report, you're going to have a name that's going to say suspect. Somebody named going there on that police report. And then on that other side, it's going to say victim. Wow. Now, I've been arrested 60 times. Wow. I don't want my name on that victim side. And that's by any means necessary. Wow. Let me, let me, you know what happened years ago. I go back again. You know, when I was in Houston, Texas, I went to the movie theater. It was in the 80s. And I watched this movie called Colors. And back then, I really, this was really the first I seen of it. That was the, really the first. We didn't see it before that. I'm telling you. And I ain't seen it yet. <laughs> <laughs> they wrote a movie and when I left out, when I left out that movie theater them boys start fighting right after that I'm not playing this is influence I'm telling you people say rap music but the movie that movie that night in Houston Texas I don't think I've watched that movie Colors yeah. oh it's very it's a huge movie I, I have to sit down with you much as you watch the movie we gotta watch that one together you gotta see this I think Ice-T was sitting there <laughs> Ice-T was the yeah. one I thought he wrote it I thought it was his movie I'm being honest because mm-hmm. that's the only one that I remember I knew his song was on there I, the, I remember Colors. the song Colors I am a nightmare walking a psychopath mm-hmm. all this we promoting this now how much do how much the impact of that movie do you think influenced what happened with the movement of the Crips and the Bloods? Well, I ain't never seen it, and 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 as far in the eighties, it created. Yeah, I wouldn't care the eighties, the seventies, or whatever year it come out. I ain't seen it yet, and ain't gonna see, see it. it. I'm still living in living colors, oh. so I don't need to look at no TV to know what's happening about menace to society, Friday, all that gone. It's in living colors, though. So I think it played a role as far as creating a culture to where it was acceptable, uh, exotic. But uh, my friend Al Sean Martin. Uh, who was uh, a run around with six nine? Had wrote a song. This ain't fashion. Wow. Mm-hmm. So it could influence those to where you know, just like the record, you see it audio visually, and it influences. You want to mimic that. You want to act that. Like when I grew up, my my heroes, who I looked up to and hung around, was Tookie, and it was their characteristics, they swagger. They style, they grace. These are the things that I picked up. Uh, they didn't teach me how to pull no trigger. They didn't teach me uh, uh, ever a conversation of go do this. It was known what to be done. So as far as the movie Colors, I think it was great. It was no more different than Monster Cody uh, wrote his book. It was something new, innovative for that area and of that time period. But never have I looked at it like it influenced nothing when you up in prison fighting the BGF, the Mexican Mafia, and Brotherhood, the Muslims, Nation of Islam, and all these other groups, UBNs, police, and you coming in talking about you hurting blacks and you got Black Panthers, George Jackson. I don't need to see no movie. I'm in a survival mode. I don't need to see nothing that, that resembles comedy to me. Wow. That's what it looked like, comedy. Have you ever thought about telling your story in a movie? Oh, I get offers, but I don't like talking about me. I don't. Sometimes you can stick. A turtle keep his head tucked, what, in? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For protection. Yeah, but like I said earlier, you your story has to be told in order for it to project the way out. You've changed. Yeah. So that change has to be seen too. I tell a lot of my partners, I ain't had a drink of smoke in 20 some years. And uh, they always want to bring up the part about being the, you know, in the drugs and, and being one hell of all the people following doing what I was doing. I get it. But what about these 25 some years that I ain't done nothing but just, you know, try to do the right thing? Are y'all going to publicize that too? Mm-hmm. So I said that to say your story and the impact that you've had on the culture, um, 
to me, it, it has to be told. You see, because people glamorize the negativity, the negative stuff. Because even like, say, example, you tell your story and you go back to what you used to be and what you are now. Some kids will look at that. The people who want to still be in the street would look at what you did and be like, man, that's what I want to do. They're not looking at how you change and what you're trying to do. They're just looking at that part of it. And mm-hmm. that's all they're going to take from that. You mm-hmm. see what I mean? But somebody else would look at it and be like, man, I've been wanting to get out of this game. If he got out, I can get out too. So, Let me tell you a story. A uh, young man out of New York. It was New Year's Eve, and I'm just looking. And uh, I see where he wrote, Mighty New Year's Resolution. I'm quit gang banging. And I looked, seen it generate a lot of conversation. And a lot of them was telling him, uh, kind of down talking him about doing that. So I put a little word in there and said, take more of a man to sit up and fall back than it does to join this and some other words. Mm-hmm. And more importantly, he has the right to make that choice. It's choices that you make. And I commended him for what he's doing and that changed the dialogue. See, a lot of times uh, the youths of the day, they just, Nobody showed that they care for them, to Mm -hmm. give them the direction. A lot of us do the work that needs to be done, but we can't help everybody. When you said that, I was wondering, how easy is it to quit a gang? Is it possible? Because... I only know from you know movies, which you don't watch. But <laughs> but I, I know I know the movies because they don't told me something about them. But I ain't watched them. I ain't named them yet. But, you know, movies make you feel like um, there's no walking out. If you want to get out, you get out in a casket. That's right. Let me tell you what no walking out is to me, as far as just a, on a gangster tip. You can always walk away from. Uh, your environment or your circumstances. You had that choice because if you're really solid about your conviction, you will die for your conviction. As simple as that. Now, what can happen is, uh, what can happen is, a lot of times, economic and social pressure dictate that they stay around because of the environment Mm -hmm. that they are subjected to. I call it ISIS, I-C-S-S acronym, inner city stress syndrome. Uh, the conditions that a youth is brought up under where it's like PTSD or something because they've been in the same type of situation, homelessness, uh, gunfire, murders, mental health, drug abuse. All these things contribute to inner city stress syndrome. So I just think that something needs to be done to where we really can make a change to, with these youths, but also you have to give them something to where they can feed themselves. Right. Because a person will follow you and listen to you mm-hmm. more so if you can feed them. But if you hungry and they hungry, it's going to be kind of hard to change that man's mind without showing him how to eat. That's, the, that's exactly what I would always say because um, I remember we interviewed a gentleman from Haiti who was... Um, he had ran for prime minister before, and he had lost, but he was planning to run again. So we virtually interviewed him, and he was talking about, because Haiti have very bad gun, gun violence, right? And so I was trying to figure out from him, so what are you planning to do that's different to you know, help the country and so forth? He's like, take the guns off the street. I said, how are you going to do that? The difference that I saw with him, he was willing to go to the inner city, to the areas that have these guns and say, okay, I'm going to get y'all jobs because we know that you have to feed your family. That's the reason why you're doing what you're doing because you're trying to make money to feed your multiple families and so forth. So you give me the guns and I give you jobs for your families and stuff like that so you can provide. So, but what I knew about Caribbean islands just because I'm from Jamaica, is the fact that, yes, you're willing to go down to this one inner city and say that, but there are multiple inner cities that are going through the same situation. Because you have, where you have two inner cities, they're 
warring against each other. So to say, just like Buds and Crips, but just a certain Pat area. Patsy also said, because Democrats, right. Republicans. Right. No, well, it, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. All of them the same. They, same they, got, right. they are politicking and they have their own agenda. That's right. Exactly. That's what all this is about, politics. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, and he was, I, I was saying to him, I said, okay, fine. You went over here to this one city, but are you willing to go to each and every one and say the same thing and do the same thing? And he didn't really say anything about that because he said he only went to that one. I said, well, you can't just go to one because this one put down a gun, but that one still have the gun. They have to protect themselves. So you have to look at just not just one area, but everywhere. Because even in Jamaica, where you have one area, you have like a Don, a person who's over everybody in that area. And I used to always find it good and bad because that person will keep the peace in their area. There would be no crime. There's nothing in that area. They might fight against somebody else in another area, but they kept the peace in that area. I mean, like if somebody stole from somebody in that area, that person' fingers might be lost the next day. Mm -hmm. They held accountable. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I would always say that people need to have more of that in all of these different areas, and you'll have more structure. Mm -hmm. But you don't. Right, because there's no chain of command, and it's the same thing uh, over, I imagine, in Haiti. As here, you have too many factions. And that's, this go back to gun control and gun laws. Uh, it's, uh, when you got a community where everybody has guns illegally, mm -hmm. a lot of times men are carrying weapons to protect themselves. Right. I mean, it's, it's like you going out into this world to where you, everybody else carrying a pistol and you carrying a bow and arrow. Or you just out there and, and, and we really need to, uh, I, I'm not one that believe in turning your weapons in. Mm -hmm. Because you have other races that, will, that have weapons. That have weapons and they not training them on they self mm -hmm. that statistically that I see. And so they, you know, they had their gangs and most of them are, are bred and breeded to be aggressors toward blacks in That's every so race. So why would we do that? And if we would come together, that doesn't mean nothing because we still have other races where we don't get along with. Wow. So we need to clean up our own backyard mm -hmm. before we even go worrying about something. What is your here. ratio of success with um, helping the young folks? Well, uh, right it depends now. on what are you talking about when it comes to, to helping. Help. To help, uh, as in like change their mind. Because I always say it's lack of education. Um, why a lot of them still do what they do and not, you know what I mean? But um, really have them change their mindset about just being on the streets and just, I'm going to die out here in prison type of mentality. Well, I can say that a lot of people usually when they inbox me or ask me for guidance or ask me questions, it's usually uh, for the better because I'm not going to give out nothing or tell somebody else's child uh, to go break no laws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that because I wouldn't want no child, no person to tell my daughter or my sons to go break the law. If mm -hmm. I'm going to do something and I want them, I'm going to tell them. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we have a pretty high successful rate in it, and it uh, we work with a group called Credible Messengers, me and I, Tola Marvin, along with uh, King Tone, uh, Sean Stevenson, Stock the Violence, uh, Charleston. Work with a lot of people all across at Faircon, uh, 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 Peace, Increase the Peace, uh, Khalid Shaw, Danny Bakewell, Maxine Waters, wow. uh, 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 what was her name? Uh, Camilla Harris at one time. Uh, so we worked with a lot of them to try to to put this together, man. Do you think but, we'll ever get to a, a place where um, you can see the violence decrease? Well, actually, the violence had decreased the lowest uh, in about 2019 or 2018 than it had been in since 1966. Wow. And uh, uh, a lot of times we have to look to our local elected officials and government and hold them accountable for not sustaining it. You'll want these grassroots, and you can look it up statistically. Violence had went down quite a bit with a lot of effort of grassroots, but we didn't get the support 
from the local elected officials to come on and to further that. They've had plenty of opportunities. So we have to look toward leadership and change within the community, those that are not actually serving the community. Well, we got one more question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, um, okay, because <clears throat> I didn't, I don't think I asked you this yet, but um, what, um, when, when Nipsey H Hussle was, uh, was uh, murdered in front of his store, what, impact did that have on California? Because from the outside looking in, from Texas, it seemed as if it brought people together for a second. You heard small things that went on, but after that, for a second, then after that, it was just over. Or did we, or it just, the, 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 the people stopped talking about it on TV and it made us, the press stop, you know, holding press on it. What, 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 what was up with that? I mean, how did the people affect, do you think it affected in a positive way to where it made people change? Yeah, you had uh, mostly a, a positive effect or brought awareness uh, to whatever. Uh, uh, it could be uh, awareness to gun violence. It could be awareness to economical empowerment. It could be uh, awareness to how you can uh, come from out the gutter and change your life. It's a lot of things that, uh, and like I say, I'd like to speak, and, and we really need to quit speaking ill of the dead. Okay. A lot of times on this social media, we're speaking up, and, and if you don't have something to say positive, it's best to let that go. So when it comes to Nipsey, he did have an impact because of his culture, and regardless of guys that were from a friend, family of four, or worn fractions, they still, he had that respect. And it was tragic to what it had, but it also created the opportunity for us and those that were on the west side, uh, Los Angeles, because you got Bompton, Compton, Watts, Los Angeles, west side, east side, not south central. I'm off the west side. He's off the west side. I grew up over there. I know quite a lot of his family members. So he had an impact, but particularly uh, when the uh, incident occurred for 30 days, uh, pretty much across the L.A. County, that's what I, and at the west side, there was no gunplay. There was a, a morning, they had a LA Gangs Unite to where a lot of the guys came. But once again, local elected officials, the newspapers, they didn't write nothing in there. It might have been on TMZ and the white folks, but when it came to the local black newspaper, and we have to remember the uh, propaganda, and if it's not used in its proper right, and we have yellow journalism to where they are not reporting real news, Hitler controlled the Jews by mm -hmm. this. So the same thing can occur. We didn't get the airplay, we didn't get what we needed, but a lot of people went and ascended to another level behind that with fake prophecies where it was uh, profit over uh, property as far as helping the community, and they went on and they came back. So once again, we have to go to our elected officials and those that are held accountable that could create it a safe haven and an avenue for this dialogue to continue. And they're still having uh, 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 events for him and, and things, but we also have an events for other organizations and other groups of men that are also doing it. So that's yeah. part of the game. I, because I believe the store, uh, we it closed down and, and, and that was something we went before we, I, I'm a clothing store owner myself, so we went to the store, frequent into store when we would come to LA because we black business owner. I met him at Magic. Me and him talked, and it was without anybody around, just me and him, you know, and about business, you know, and uh, you know, it was dear to us, and we right, we we went over there beforehand because we we are family that we're like that. Our kids work in the store, and it's the same vibe, you know. And um, <clears throat> just was a horrible thing when I seen that happen. The way they broadcast it across the social media waves, you just don't see things broadcast like that um, uh, back in the days when we first came up. You know what I mean? Well, they didn't have the social media now, yeah. or the advent of the phone. But even on the news, you didn't you didn't see it. You, you they would show you maybe the yellow tape, or maybe a you know some some they would never even show you. They would they were very very precise to not showing you mm -hmm. certain things on the, that television, yeah. which tells you a vision. But that's a difference between the television, they monitor and they you know, decide what you need to see. Social media, 
First come, first serve. Boom. Whoever can get a video first, that's what you're going to see. And what's amazing is uh, you use an artist's record, and in five seconds, they beat on took your video down for uh, using the so artist's right. record. But you, we don't have uh, uh, Indian Red Boy get uh, uh, killed on, on Instagram or Facebook Live. They didn't take that mm -hmm. down. We we was in 2015, they was posting dead bodies, man down here. So a lot of times we have to hold uh, social media and those that are running that and stand up for us. Mm -hmm. You will you will chastise us. Uh, you know, we we as a race, we, we look, we hear Megan's Law, Amber Alert, Three Strikes. Mm -hmm. Every time a, a white person uh or somebody other than our race have a problem, they make a law and name it. And here we is, we we have to really stand up and be proud of ourselves first and come to love ourselves first. That's the but, message I preach. Go ahead. Well, I was, we just, I mean, what did you, I'm gonna let you get you one more, one more say, <laughs> and then we gonna shut it. I can't, I, I know we got a time, we gotta stay true um, to it. No, but the th social media have its pros and cons. Because if it wasn't for people taking up those videos, yes, it's gruesome and, you know, it's bad. But and if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have a lot of things coming to awareness. You know what I mean? Even like with the vaccine, when you talk about the vaccine and everybody is so scared to take the vaccine and so forth. When I think about back in the days growing up in school and you had vaccines for everything, but we had to take it. But we didn't know how many people actually died from the vaccines that we were taking as kids because we didn't broadcast it. Didn't broadcast it, but because of all this awareness is bringing up to everybody through social media, it put fear in us because now we have the choice to say, "Okay, this is what happens. Do I do I want to take it or do I not want to take it?" You see what I mean? So there are pros and cons from you know social media and everybody having their phones up because even with police brutality, people being stopped illegally and you have a, you know, the phone, you have somewhat proof compared to their body cam, which can go missing. Let me say something about uh, the difference than maybe you and, and, and people that's really about this. I've seen a lot of people with George Floyd where they had cameras up. Mm -hmm. If I'd have been there, they'd have had to kill me with George Floyd. Wow. Hey, Mark, that was our mentality. I wouldn't have been there taking no picture. I'd have had to take that ass whooping or whatever. And I got video where I've done it before and told them, you're going to have to kill me or take me to jail behind violating my rights. So when you go to talking about video and standing there and that, no, sometimes you got to intervene. Wow. Mm -hmm. Instead of sitting there, it's no way I could have sat there and watch no man die. die. And they'd have to whoop my ass because I would have knew they ain't going to kill me. I might get my ass whooped, but I ain't going to let them sit up here and do that brother like that. Wow. No. Well, hey, man, thank you so much, man. We, we definitely, man, we love you, brother. Thank you for coming on our show. Thank you, man. man. And I appreciate it. And I uh, hope I did. You oh, man, you did. Man, come on, yeah, man. I, 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 you I always do awesome. I man. just come off the top of the head. <laughs> <laughs> right, man, no thank shit. you so much, man. We love you, man. And it's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101. Oh, yeah.